testing one too. Right? You got it. Okay. Well, on behalf of the Explorers Club and the Rocky Mountain Chapter, welcome to this uh, very special presentation. Tonight's talk is part of uh, the Fjall Raven Explorers Club uh, speaker series, which Fjall Raven is holding at their stores in LA, Houston, Chicago, New York, Vancouver, and here in Boulder. Um, Fjall Raven, as you may know, has been an important partner with the Explorers Club as we pursue exploration in the land, sea, air, and in space. And for those of you who are new to the Explorers Club, uh, we're based in New York. We're founded in 1904. And some of our uh, previous members are Frederick Cook, Robert Perry, Roald Amundsen, Tor Heyerdahl, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, the, well, they've, they've all passed. But the, our current <laughs> members who are still with us happily include Buzz Aldrin, Sylvia Earle, Jane Goodall, Neil deGrasse Tyson, James Cameron, Jeff Bezos, and uh, Elon Musk. There are 3,600 members of the Explorers Club around the world. Um, there are 34 chapters, and I'm certainly honored to be the chair of the Rocky Mountain chapter, which uh, takes place between the Canadian border and the Mexican border. So we've got pretty big, uh, pretty big geographic territory. So we kind of picked a spot right in the middle, called it Boulder, which is also near my house, so that's good. <laughs> um, we invite the public to come to our events. Our next event is uh, November 8th. Five under 35 is the theme for that. Five explorers under the age of 35 who are changing the world that the world needs to know about. And, and one of our speakers is Katie Borsler. And Katie's here, and she'll be speaking on November 8th. That's at Fjall Raven in um, Denver. And then in December, we have two local scientists who explain why we should be incredibly excited about April 8th, 2024. Who knows? what that date is, it's the eclipse. Yeah. And who knows how close, what's the closest the eclipse gets to, Den to uh, Boulder? Uh, Texas. Yes, exactly. Uh, Dallas is the closest it comes to Boulder. But if you live in St. Louis, Detroit, Toronto, Montreal, Cleveland, <coughs> Rochester, and Buffalo, they're all in the zone of totality. So maybe that event will, will push politics off the page for at least a day. <laughs> when that <laughs> Keep an eye on our website. It's explorers-rm.org. Zo <laughs> Zone of totality. So this topic tonight came to us after um, I read The New Yorker in June 26, 2023, and I was horrified. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch, it said in the, in the article, a collection of floating debris that stretches 600,000 miles, square miles, between California and Hawaii. Elephants are among the creatures being done in by this junk, as well as corals, tortoises, and elephants in particular. In recent years, 20 elephants died from eating plastic in landfill. How about tires? And we're all complicit in this. Tires that contain a wide variety of plastics. As they roll along, they abrade sending clouds of particles spinning into the air. And the most horrifying of all, the most tragic, in 2021, researchers from Italy announced they found microplastics in human placenta. A few months later, researchers from Germany and Austria announced that they'd found microplastics in meconium, the technical term for an infant's first poop. And when I read that, I'm just absolutely uh, just disgusted by that. But on a happier note, we have Mickey McComb Cosmo speaking here for us today. She's been a tireless advocate for sharks, highlighting their global declines and framing new directions for their conservation. She's executive director of Ocean First Institute. I call her the landlocked shark researcher, <laughs> but she does more than study sharks. Ocean First, that's a <laughs> Amber <laughs> alert. It's <laughs> the landlocked shark researcher. Um, Ocean First Institute is based in Boulder and Key Largo. It's uniquely positioned. <laughs> what is that? Can we uh, silence your cell phones? Yeah, thank you. 
Ocean First Institute is based in Boulder and Key Largo. It's uniquely positioned to study and educate on the impacts of plastic pollution from mountains to mangroves with their microplastics pollution program. Uh, Mickey holds a PhD in integrative biology from Florida Atlantic University and is author of numerous scientific publications. We'll have Mickey speak for 15 minutes. Then uh, Uliana Pena will introduce our next speaker, Katerina Lapina, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Oh, no Mickey. Problem. That sounds great. All right, well, thank you. Um, so tonight, oh, oh Mike. Mike. Oh, <laughs> Here you go. We'll see. Hello, hello. Does it make a difference? No. Nope. Okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't make a difference. So, does it make a difference at all? It, it does for the recording. Oh, okay. So I'll put it on for the recording. Okay. We got this. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for coming tonight. I'm excited to uh, talk to you about microplastics uh, and microfibers tonight. And uh, before I do that, I just I, I want to tell you the story about it, which might be surprising to you. Uh, and I, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I got interested in this topic in the first place. And so I run, as Jeff said, a nonprofit called Ocean First Institute. And it's based in Boulder. We also have a location in the Florida Keys. And it's all about ocean conservation through research and education. And so I do a lot of my research on sharks. That's my passion. Uh, and we try to connect uh, our students and the general public through the research we do and to get them excited. So even underwater, you can't stop me from talking. Um, I love to talk about sharks and their story and why these iconic species really are um, important uh, ambassadors to talk about what's going on in the ocean. And so my staff down in the Keys does work on sharks. And again, all with really trying to inspire and connect students and youth with nature and why these species really do need um, conservation. And um, we also have uh, research that occurs here in Colorado connecting fish. And so I uh, spearheaded a project to reintroduce a native endangered fish called the northern red-bellied dace. And so many of our students go out into the field to release these animals. And it's a really great connection between Colorado uh, and all of the connections that we have um, to the rest of the planet through our rivers and streams here in Colorado. And so we, we do work a lot on fish and wildlife and awareness, but we also do work on microplastics. And that story is really interesting on how that became part of our programs and how that became really a big part um, of what we do. And so you likely have heard about the plastic ocean crisis and what's happening in the ocean and what marine debris is. And so marine debris is just simply plastic that has unintentionally ended up in the ocean. That's all it is. And we have 150 million metric tons of plastic in the ocean right now, over 5 trillion pieces. And 14 million tons enter the ocean annually. And in 2050, it's estimated we're going to have more plastic in the ocean than fish. So this is a crisis. And you might ask, well, why is plastic such a pervasive issue in the ocean? And really, it's a simple thing. It's because plastic is buoyant. And it's also really um, the issue of degradability. So the plastic that we've created on the planet since really the 50s, when this took off and we really started to have kind of a throwaway society with TV dinners and Tupperware parties and all of the plastic that we consume um, so frequently, uh, plastic never ever goes away. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. So everything that we've made is still out there. It's just becoming smaller and smaller. It never ever goes away and that's the issue. And so when you look at the planet and you look at it from the perspective of the ocean, then you can see these beautiful currents that swirl on our planet and those are uh, gyres. These are, this is the reason why we get these concentrations of plastics all in our different ocean basins 
all over the planet. And, and so you can see here, this is why it's almost like a swirling toilet. Um, this is where plastics concentrate. And it's not like you go out there and you see a big trash pile. It's really at the surface and a little bit below, you have basically a soup of small pieces of plastic, and that's what it's like. Um, but it also includes um, discarded fishing gear. All kinds of things are in this huge gyre. Um, and we have five gyres all over the planet filled with our plastic trash, and 99% of it is plastic. So what does it mean? Well, it's interesting because you have plastic coming off land, so most of the plastic entering the ocean is from land-based sources, and because it's buoyant, it floats, and so then you have birds, you have whale sharks, you have all of these animals feeding on this plastic, sea turtles eating plastic bags, all of that happens at the surface, and then over time, wave action and sun starts to break down plastic into smaller and smaller pieces. And then that starts to become uh, less buoyant and that starts to finally sink into the deep ocean. And so today, in our trenches, we're finding evidence of human activity because we're finding plastics in the deepest parts of the ocean. So really no place on Earth has been left untouched by our plastic consumption and creation. And that now is found in the guts of fish. Um, all kinds of marine life are now ingesting plastics. And so you might say, let's just recycle it. That's the answer, right? Why can't we do better? Why can't we fix this? And the issue is here. This graph shows you that most of plastic uh, ends up in landfills. That's the problem. And so recycling is just this little piece here. So as much as we want to rely on the belief that we can recycle what we create, it's really a lie. We can't. We don't. And it's not an effective way to get rid of this plastic that we're um, consuming. Um, at an absolutely staggering rate. And so the journey of plastic is, uh, is an interesting one because it pervades almost every single part of our life uh, on, on a daily, hourly basis. Anywhere you go, if you go to a restaurant, if you go to a gas station, um, you're bombarded with all of the things that are encased in plastic. And I don't want to demonize plastic because it's an amazing uh, product and it does amazing things for us in humanity. but what I don't love and what I think you'll agree is that single-use plastics, the ones that last for a few minutes, if that is really what I'm talking about. And so you can see the journey of plastic can be from water bottles to food containers to plastic bags. And again, um, landfills are filled with, with these items. And again, as they break down, they just become smaller and smaller pieces. So the types of plastics, there's macroplastics, which are the larger pieces, which then break down into microplastics. And this is less than five millimeters in size. Microplastics also include nanoplastics, uh, which are even smaller and, and nearly microscopic. Um, and there's also another one called nurdles. And nurdles are small pieces that are created to be melted down to create products. And so there's a few different types. And then there's also microfibers. How many of you have heard of microfibers before? Pretty much all of you. So microfibers come from our clothing. So as we wash our clothing in our washers, um, those, uh, those fibers come out. So just like when you're doing your laundry and you, you go to the dryer and you have a lint trap. This is sadly from my own lint trap. Whoops, that's a little embarrassing. But this is my lint trap. So this is what's in the dryer. Imagine what's in the washer. It goes out in the water. It doesn't get filtered out. So all of this stuff that's from a dryer is the same in the washer, maybe even more, and it doesn't get um, filtered out. So that is what a microfiber is. So where does pollution, plastic pollution go? Well, we know that it goes in the ocean. We know that it goes on land. But I think for me, the startling aha <laughs> moment was that it's actually in the air. And I didn't know that. And that really surprised me. So it was about, it was 2019, I was reading a study, and it was from a guide, in or a ranger in Rocky Mountain National Park, and he was doing a study on rainfall, rain gauges. He set out rain gauges all across the Rocky Mountains to collect rain. And when he was processing his samples, he started to see a bunch of things and he didn't know what it was. And it turns out it was microfibers that were falling from the sky into his rain gauges. So the headline was, it's raining plastic. 
microscopic fibers fall from the sky in Rocky Mountains. It blew my mind. I was like, you have to be kidding. So I started to think about my backyard, my home creek. This is the St. Vrain Creek right by Lyons. Does it have the stuff in it? I don't know. I had no idea. And I started to, it bothered me and I wanted to know. So what I did is I went to my local high school, made friends with the science teacher, and I said, let's go find out. What do you think? Can we take students out and go sampling? And he said, absolutely, let's go. And so we spent a year out in the field together collecting water samples um, and sediment samples to try to figure out if there's microplastics or microfibers in our backyard. And um, here we are collecting sediments right off the bank at the rack line and um, here's what we found out. So we went back to class and we filtered the water. So you can see here he's pouring in the creek water and it's going through a little paper filter. And um, as we do that, everything that is, uh, is, is on the filter stays on the filter. We dry it and then we look at it under the microscope. So what do you guys think? Do you guys think we found microplastics and microfibers? I'm afraid we did in every single one of our samples. This is what we found. Microplastics, the colored pieces, and microfibers. So we were shocked, and the students were a little bit angry, to be honest. They couldn't believe what we found. They were surprised. And so um, just- What's the definition now of the sizes, perhaps, of these microplastics? So microplastics um, uh, are considered anything five millimeters or less. And then nanoparticles um, are ones that are microscopic. And um, nurdles, again, are ones that are quite large, created for meltdown. Um, but the interesting part is what Jeff alluded to. It's, it's, so it's there. OK, great. What does that mean, though, to us um, as human beings and to wildlife? Well, the answer is it's in the air. And so for the first time, um, it's been detected in our lungs. It's been detected in our bloodstream. It's been detected in our brains, and it's been detected, as Jeff said, in the placental connection between mothers and embryos. Um, so this is an, a huge issue, and the long-term effect of this is truly unknown. We don't know yet what that means. Um, what's interesting, too, is now it's, it's, uh, it's determined that we're eating a credit card size worth of plastic every month in our bodies. So it's here to stay. And we have to figure out what does that mean. And I think that's the concern. And <laughs> the other thing, just as Jeff said, um, babies, are uh, their, their feces has tenfold more than adult humans. So for some reason, babies are taking up more plastic um, in their bodies, and they're shedding it in their feces. And again, we don't know what that means. It could be from baby bottles. It could be from all kinds of different sources. But this is alarming, for sure, for human health. So I, after doing this uh, pilot study with lions, went and got funding from, the, um, from SCFD, which is a Colorado agency that brings in money from sales tax, to try to expand our study. And that's exactly what we did. So for the last three years, I've taken students into count six different Colorado counties to collect uh, water and sediment from streams in their backyards to see what we can find there. And what we found um, is not super surprising. We, we did about 130 samples in 2022 with nine schools in six counties. We had 1,600 students, and voila, we found on average 12 microplastics in water samples and 19 in our sediment samples. This is just one sample. Um, and out of 184 samples, we had two that we didn't find anything. Two. So it's definitely pervasive. And again, the, the thing that I found so interesting is that the students, their response to this was that they were upset, they were surprised, and more than anything, they wanted to do something about it. And that was the part that I found so refreshing. And so I held student sum outs, uh, student, I'm sorry, student shout outs uh, summits at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and also at the Butterfly Pavilion. And it was an opportunity for them to be scientists. So I asked them to do poster presentations and oral presentations just as scientists do, and they did. But the thing that was most exciting 
is that it became a forum where everybody started talking about what they're going to do about it, what they found as a trick, and it became this really cathartic opportunity for everybody to say, hey, I, I'm doing something, you can do something too. It, it's sometimes the littlest things that can add up and really be um, a game changer. And so that was really refreshing um, for us to see. And then we have expanded and got funded down in our Florida location by Ocean Conservancy to expand and replicate this model. So we're really proud that this is in Key Largo Sound. And you can see these samples right here. Um, this is uh, right from Key Largo Sound. And on the top, you can see that some of that is organic matter, but a lot of it is brightly colored microplastics. So again, we're finding it um, in our nets. And that's what our net looks like when we're doing our sampling. And one of the great uh, things that has also come from this uh, work is that we, were, we, we just got an expensive FTIR machine, uh, which allows us to put our plastic samples in. And it actually uses uh, infrared to allow us to understand the chemical signature of the microplastic itself. And that helps us understand the origin. Where did it come from? What's the composition? And that helps us identify a lot of uh, information about the, the plastics that we didn't have before. And that's going to allow us to publish in the scientific literature the samples that are collected from students here in Colorado and in Florida. And I'm really proud of that because they're going to be part of that process. And so looking forward, I told you that this was going to be a high alpine talk. And so just as we know that it was raining plastic in Rocky Mountains, I believe it's going to be uh, captured in the snowpack. I, I just feel like if it's in the mountains, of course, it's going to be in the snow. And so I'm very interested in expanding our sampling into the snowpack. Um, but what's also interesting is as the snow melts, that water funnels down to certain places in the catchments. So I'm very interested also in sampling in these high alpine lakes. And these high alpine lakes are sometimes the final repository for endemic fish species. And so I'm concerned about the fish as well. So it's a double one-two punch for me to be able to look at the plastic signature of these areas uh, and to try to understand if these microplastics are there. And again, what does it mean? So luckily, I'm so excited um, that I have an ambassador here tonight who is going to do some of the original sampling for us. Um, on her high alpine expeditions and uh, she's a chronic mountaineer and is every time I look at her she's somewhere summiting with Ricardo it's an unbelievable so Uliana is gonna kindly help us on our efforts and I'm so proud and excited to have her um, join our team in this effort it's really really exciting for us and then lastly, I just want to end on you know, the fact that each one of us, um, you know, our government has sort of failed us in, the, in, in really trying to establish a circularity here for you know, what we know we need to do to reduce this, this you know, absolute avalanche of plastic that's entering um, the environment. And you know, it will come. We will fix this. And the governments are, are acting. There's a lot of things that are happening. But the individual is, is where we are tonight, and that's what we're going to focus on uh, tonight, is to really think about what each of us can do. And you know, human behavior is interesting. Um, there's just little steps that we can take that are sustainable and that can change the game. And so uh, all of these things here are really going towards the idea of you know, consuming wisely, purchasing wisely, thinking about your plastic footprint and trying to make a difference. And so tonight, I'm going to give each one of you um, this little box of 60 laundry sheets. And what this is, is this was donated to us by Earth Breeze. What it is, is it's a laundry sheet. So just like you have a dryer sheet that you put in, you can do laundry sheets now. And that avoids buying the detergent that's liquid, mostly water, that's in a big plastic jug that usually ends up in a landfill. So it's a one-two punch. And so I have a 15-year-old football player who's stinky and a husband who, since he isn't here, he's stinky too. Um, and I use these, and they work. So it's a really great first step for you to think about how you can uh, reduce your plastic footprint. So I'm going to give each one of you uh, these tonight. You're, you're welcome to have it. And I have some other little samples of things that you might be interested in that really do help. And then one of the last things I'll mention is um, Again, microfibers are going out of the laundry. 
And so there is help on the way in industry, but before that, you can buy what's called a coral ball, which is this one right here, this little blue one, and I have one on the table. I use it. You put it in your wash, washing machine, and it captures microfibers, um, and it pulls them out. So you, it's like a little lint catcher. You can also retrofit your washer with little filters. These are about 80 bucks and you just install it. And that again filters out the this that's obviously probably going out in your washing machine. And then there's also a, a guppy, guppy friend, which is a, a guppy wash bag, which you put all your clothes in and that helps capture that too. It may seem like a small thing in a big avalanche of issue, but again, if all of us start to, to do this, it really is gonna make a difference. And I would end on this, hope. These kids um, have been working with me for years in the field, going out, helping restore fish into habitats, helping doing uh, the, the plastic pollution programs, doing cleanups. These, these kids, these students are, for me, they're now, they're not the future, they're right now. And they don't really know the word no. They are excited about taking on the challenges. And these kids and the animals and the environment are worth fighting for. And that's what we're doing. We're fighting the fight to you know, help make a better world for them, a better world for, our, you know, for animals uh, that are out there and don't have a choice. And this is what really gives me fuel, is to know that you know, these guys are fighting really, really hard for the planet. And I know we can too. And that's it. Thank you. I have a question. Do we want to take questions at the end, Jeff? Yeah, we'll do questions at the end. Yeah. Really? Sorry. <laughs> this is on point. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. First, I wanted to say I do use EarthBreeze. So it's not just you speaking. It definitely works, and it does avoid plastic, as does milk in glass and things that we can do to avoid using plastics. But I, my question is really this, is what alternatives, such as uh, plant resins as a derivative, derivatives of plant resident, residents can we use or can be used to avoid the plastics that are currently yeah I, I would yeah oh absolutely so what are some of the alternatives plant-based alternatives that can be used in in lieu of plastic and I would say there is a slew of things that can be used down to mushroom packaging um, for Amazon um, to you know plastic um, alternatives that are not petroleum based there's a couple of companies that even are working on bacteria that will in that will break it down petroleum based plastics and so I think there's a whole horizon of How things well, that's a great question. I think it's, it's fighting those that have power and those that don't want to see the changes because they'll lose economically. I think it's always been that race. And you know that's above my pay grade, but I can definitely say um, I, I see more pressure than ever before because I think people are fed up, especially young people. They're pissed off and they want to see better and they want to do better. And so I hope more than anything, that we start to see these real alternatives come come to fruition. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Are we taking questions? Is it okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Great, great talk. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I wouldn't give plastics a pass when you say plastics do great things. I mean, we have glass, we have aluminum. Ball Ball is now doing, you know, yeah. water in cans that are. I mean, um, you know, people talk about compostables. Are they really any better? You know, they go into the landfill and they're contributing. But, you know, I have a question about the microplastics that are submillimeter in size. You say, because well, you, you did the samples from the river and you could look at them in a microscope yeah. and you can see them. What about the ones you don't see? That's the FTIR. That, that's yeah, a exactly. great question. That's yeah. And that's yeah. exactly it is. I was afraid of going up into snowpack and having a collection and then we can't see it but it doesn't mean that it isn't there. And that's the, the point of the FTIR machine um, that is gonna be able to allow us to detect um, some of these absolutely you know, minuscule uh, particles of plastic that are pervasive and entrained into you know, the, the water cycle now. There, it's raining plastic and we're ingesting it, we're breathing it, which is just amazing to think about. 
So, We're yeah. This planet onto the young people. I mean, they should be upset. Yeah, oh, they are. They definitely are. Is and it true that Falafel Robin clothing does not shed microplastics? Like if we're here at Falafel Robin? I mean, Y'all Robin, sorry. Yeah. Y'all Robin, I'm sorry. Yeah. Y'all Robin. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, that, that's the other interesting part, and I, and I won't go on and on about this, but if we all were to wear cotton based clothes, which would be the yeah. ultimate, um, we can't sustain the crops that would be required to grow that. So I think in answer to your question, you know, uh, is that we have to have not a one-size-fits-all answer to these things. You have to be able to, uh, to, to meet people along the path because it is not black and white. And, um, you know, when I say give a pass, I'm talking about maybe medical stuff or, yeah. you know, things like that. And, and you know, it, for, for better or for worse, it does have utility. It's cheap. It's, it's easy. It's good. But um, the, the way that we use it, the, the, the pervasiveness of it, the, the unnecessary crap. I mean, you go to a fast food restaurant and your waste pile is like that. You know, you're like, is this really necessary? It, but it's just automatic. We're on autopilot. And that's the part that I think is so then scary. You claim it's compostable. I don't know if that's any better. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a really great question. Let me invite uh, yes. Juliana to introduce our next speaker. Okay, and I'll, I'll get that set up. <laughs> I'm going to have you pass that oh. to her. Okay. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> switch talks here. Oh, sorry, could you switch the mic? Oh, yeah. Briefly grab this. Perfect. Give it to you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so Mickey, I really like when you said avalanche of plastic. And since I'll be sampling the snowpack, I might literally be encountering that <laughs> in the mountains. So great talk. This is my pleasure to introduce Katarina. Uh, we've known each other for like 10 years now, I think, or more. Uh, so she's originally from Kharkiv, Ukraine. Uh, we got to know each other initially through uh, activities in the Ukrainian community and then as scientists. Uh, so she received her master's in environmental studies and policy from Central European University in Hungary and then came stateside uh, for her PhD in environmental engineering at Michigan Tech. And the research was really cool. She was looking at impacts of forest fire uh, on air quality in the middle of the ocean, in the Atlantic, on a volcanic island and seeing that long range transport. So I remember my students being fascinated by your stories about that. Um, and then she came to Colorado in 2009 and she was responsible also. <laughs> I memorized it. <laughs> I did my research. No, um, so um, she co founded Colorado Ozone Gardens. Um, so there's, what did you say, five or six around the state now? Yeah, that was first one, first two, and now five or six in Colorado only. So there's one at NCAR up on the hill, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, so go check it out. There's good ozone and there's bad ozone. The good ozone is the one in the stratosphere that protects us from the UV radiation. The bad stuff interacts with the pollution here. Um, so that actually has impacts on plant health and human health. Right? So Katrina also guides hikes. She's a Fjall Raven guide. Um, and she's been taking many people up to Colorado 14ers. And now that's pivoting to other, other hikes, Alpine Lakes. Right? She loves Alpine Lakes. Um, and so she's doing this for members of the Ukrainian community, new refugees coming from Ukraine, and also to fundraise for the efforts of the war. So. I'll leave it to you. Oh. Uh -huh. Cool. Oh my God, I don't see. When you get older, you just stop seeing stuff. So <laughs> I don't know if that guy's works for you, but ah, uh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much for introduction, Uliana. Uh, this talk was is very hard to follow. So uh, yeah, let's see. So yes, I am. I started like since the war in Ukraine started. Um, I started leading. Um, Hikes, uh, two fourteeners mostly. This is our organization, COFO UA. It's like all uh, volunteer organizations. A few of us, small group of us, trying to do whatever we can. All volunteers. And these two pictures are from our Fjall Raven hikes. We have a lovely group of people showing up. Um, actually, this Sunday, I am leading a Walker Ranch loop at 8 a.m. If anybody would like to join, it's like eight mile loop. Very nice, very easy. And coffee will be provided at Trailhead. So. And um, and it's not working. Which way? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah. So actually, Mickey already talked so much about plastics, but uh, my own interest in environmental stuff actually started when I visited a landfill. And I'm just curious, how many of you ever been to landfill? 
quite a few. Well, I'm preaching to the choir, obviously. <laughs> I, I knew that. It will be hard, yeah. So um, uh, that was when I was in my mid-20s. I just came from Ukraine. Uh, I, um, I grew up in Soviet Union. Iron Wall uh, fell at this time. Um, company was like destroyed, just like it's now during the war. Uh, economy was collapsed. And um, by that time, I uh, had a degree in civil engineering, and I was thinking what to do next. I was very lucky to get an opportunity to go to Sweden for one, mo one month. It was a summer school in environmental sciences and policy, and they took us to a landfill. And just seeing the scale of this basically huge business with everything, you know, with construction of landfill, with all the transportation involved, all the people working there, and just seeing the scale of this disaster that we all contributed to was just shocking to me. And it's maybe I'm just easy to impress, but it changed my perception. And that's how I decided to continue my degree and like go back to study and do something in environmental field. Um, and I honestly think that young people really should go to, I should point there, right? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. I should point, really, I believe that all schools, I don't know if they do it, my, I think it will be really useful. Like Mickey said, students are shocked and angry when they find these uh, microplastics, microfibers in their samples. I think they will be really shocked and angry and will demand changes if all of them will go to landfill and see what's happening there. So I, during my PhD, I did a very cool research. Um, my advisor was a genius. Unfortunately, he tragically died just before my defense um, in a whitewater kayaking accident. He did what he loved. But he established a station right here in the middle of Atlantic. That was the uh, Azores Islands, and that was a Pico Island. What was special about Pico Island? It had a volcano, old volcano, but it was at elevation of more than two kilometers. When you're that high in the atmosphere, you can actually measure the stuff, the pollution that is traveling between continents. You probably know that, you know, nothing is new. We all know we're all connected. It's lots of global problems, climate change and so on. Pollution, air pollution is like this too. We know that California has one of the most uh, stringent um, environmental standards, but no matter how hard they try, if there is a outflow of pollution from China, still they will get really bad air quality. And we can see it, of course, this especially large fires. Whenever we have a huge fire event, it's just like uh, always colossal um, uh, scale, and it's easy to measure. But we had station right there. I was able to go there once. It was super exciting. And we were measuring all this like stuff traveling along the globe. And that's one also you know, was very easy to realize that um, so sustainability, of course, starts at individual level, at um, country level, at business level, like Fial Ravin is a great company here. And basically, we, we are all in this together, and we, all, we need to do something about this. Um, well, um, 10 days ago, I went to Coney Lake in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Anybody knows where it is? Oh, OK, great, yeah. It's a remote lake, Coney Lake, Coney Pass, in Wild Basin. It was 23 mile round trip hike. It was super cool. I was there seven, six hours by myself. I didn't see a single soul. I saw one bear, uh, well-behaving bear, was super cool. <laughs> and it's just one of those environments when you go there and you think, oh my god, it's so pristine here, right? No rain in plastic, I didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you think like, oh, it's just like it used to be, like, you know, clean water, you can almost drink from it, like, and so on. And, um, and then I always ask people, so which of these places you think has better air quality? Rocky Mountain National Park or Boulder, Colorado? And of course, it's a tricky question and very poorly defined, like for, for me as a scientist, because air quality can mean so many things. I can refer to many different air pollutants. Well, I'm talking about one here, my favorite one, uh, the one I studied for many years. And um, that pollutant is ozone that Ulana talked about. So you guys probably all know that the stratospheric ozone is great for us because it protects us from uh, harmful UV radiation. And then there is a tropospheric ozone, we call it bad ozone, because it's formed from different reactions that are forming it in the surface layer where, where we live and breathe. Well, guess what? It's uh, toxic, it's not good, um, and Colorado happened to have a real problem with ozone. For many years, um, Colorado cannot attain an um, EPA standard. EPA standard actually went down in the last few years from 75 parts per billion to 70, but we are still like, um, they cannot do much about it because it's very difficult to control because ozone is not emitted directly. It's formed from a bunch of these like 50 plus reactions or so forming ozone in the presence of sunlight. We have perfect 
um, meteorological conditions here. We also have complex, um, uh, complex topography in Colorado that traps pollution sometimes. And so when you go to Rocky Mountain National Park and people look up and they say, wow, this is so clean, beautiful mountain air, the skies are blue, they may not know that that day actually was a high ozone alert. And they inhale in very strong oxidant that is kind of affecting their lungs. It makes them sick. Of course, if you are a kid, if you are an older person, or you have asthma, you will be affected more. But now, they also new studies always show that it's also affecting mortality. So it's actually ozone is really bad. And I studied that stuff for years. So, um, so I was a postdoc at the University of Colorado, and I was sitting in my office doing modeling and data analysis and being bored a little bit. And I wanted to talk to people because I'm doing my research, and I'll publish a few papers, and maybe 10 scientists will read it, one person will quote it, I'll go to a conference, present, and it's, it's fun, but not enough. So I went to one presentation where um, the guy was talking about so-called ozone gardens. And it turns out that in Colorado, we have a very special plant growing. It's called cut leaf cornflower. Maybe you saw it on your hikes. Um, it's native to Colorado. And it's special because, um, um, because actually when the ozone concentrations are high in the air during the summer, it starts showing these uh, black dots on its leaves. And if you don't believe me, I brought one leaf with me. Oh. I collected it this Monday, seriously, for this talk. And uh, you may not be impressed uh, because I showed it to my friend and he said, well, if it changed color from green to pink, I would be more impressed. But <laughs> this doesn't happen usually. But uh, to me, these dots tell a very big story. Because if you look for the right thing, and you cannot really uh, mistake, mistake it for anything else, and we know that this is ozone, ozone damage. So the plant was stressed. Usually, if you, if you look at the leaves, early in the summer, when ozone concentrations just start to rise, you will just see a few dots. So this, I took this picture early August this year. And later you come back and you, you look at these plants and you will see lots of lots of dots. It means that at this location, ozone concentration were high. And I took this picture, by the way, by the um, Long Peak Trailhead. There are restrooms there and there is a bunch of cutleaf cornflowers growing. So next time you go there, just check out the leaves carefully, yeah. Uh, and so um, I went to NCAR and I talked to Danica, uh, who is a scientist, Danica Lombardozzi, um, and together we founded first Ozone Gardens in Colorado. And I just visited Ozone Garden is still there, and there is a network of a few gardens like this. So why also Ozone is cool? Um, I mean, why this, uh, I think personally, Ozone Gardens are cool? Ozone is invisible. So like when you, you all know about brown cloud in Denver in the, in the winter, Dur uh, dirty air, you cannot mistake it for anything else. You know that you don't want to be there and inhale that soup. Well, ozone, you cannot see it. It's invisible. So by looking at these plants, we make suddenly invisible problem visible. So it's kind of, like, kind of like going to landfill and seeing the result of your actions. But this is just looking at the plant and looking at something that is dying and not very happy. And uh, why we actually care about plants being affected by air pollution? Because plants is also our food, and there are many important crops that are affected by ozone. So like um, soybean, wheat, they are all ozone-sensitive uh, crops. And basically, this is just one of the study in GRL that showed that you, can, you could feed 94 million if actually you get your 100% crop, if there was no this air pollution. Well, Speaking of sustainability and what we can do about it, if you look at the sources, one of my research was also, I was looking at uh, source attribution. Very important, so we are looking at sources of so-called VOCs and nitrogen oxides. These are the main guys that are responsible for ozone. Many of them come from vehicles. So really driving less would really help. Driving electrical vehicles would help. Of course, oil and gas also, these are old contributions. I'm sure they changed by now, but, um, just changing your lifestyle would definitely help. Changing industries, um, cleaner energies would all help for that. This is the current map of uh, gardens in Colora Colorado. There are a few of those. Well, I don't know how much time I have, but OK. So <laughs> yeah, and this is Fjall Raven. So I'm actually super happy to be associated with this company because uh, 
you know, one of the things I love about them, their clothing is super durable, and it actually lasts for many, many years. You know, they actually design stuff that is supposed to be passed from a grandmother to a granddaughter. And really, I had jackets that are very old. So they're really trying to do more sustainable um, and durable things. Um, you asked about microplastics. Somebody asked about plastics uh, raining from uh, their clothing. Well, I don't know about plastics, but Fjallraven is one of the very few companies that completely phased out PFCs from their shell layers. Because of that, the shell layers may not be as efficient as Gore-Tex, but it's actually much, much better for environment. Because um, PFCs are basically these forever pollutants, and they're basically like, basically like my microplastics. Once you put it out there, it's not go nothing is happening to them for tens of thousands of years. They're so stable, that's why they work so well. But uh, they're actually very terrible. And I was doing some research that Patagonia, um, Gore, and so on, all these companies are also really working on trying to phase out this stuff from their shell layers which I think is just fine in Colorado if like, the rains are not as intense. But they're still working great. And this is a very cool event. I was very happy to participate this year, Fjallraven Classic. They did tons of very cool educational uh, talks and activities during this event. Uh, we had uh, people from Leave No Trace. So they take people out there, um, but instead of just trying to sell them product, they actually teach them how to you know, gently uh, you know, how to explore uh, nature uh, in a gentle way, how to make it, you know, last for future generations. Like, if you camp, where should you put tent, what you should not put tent. I just love that, yeah. They talk about history of the place. It's a really cool event that I just would like to recommend. And, uh, yeah, that's it, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if you would like to see ozone damage, there is one leaf. It's hard to see, guys, but you will be able to see the small dots. Oh, so this yeah. is ozone damage. It also usually shows just on upper side of the leaf. That's how you can tell. Yeah. Any questions for either of our speakers? Yes, sir. Yeah, do you see that similar ozone damage on like aspen leaves? Aspen le aspen's actually another ozone sensitive plant. Oh, there's but there's a huge aspen Exactly. Aspens are also ozone sensitive, but from what we understood, the type of I never know how to pronounce it. Quaking aspen, quaking aspen, quaking aspen. I say quaking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was wrong. Yeah, English is so confusing. Yeah, I don't think they they do have some. They they do not produce this damage, but it's a very good question. Aspens are also ozone sensitive. So the ozone gardens that you created are those to to show the ozone damage, just sort of as a an example so people can physically see the damage or do you encourage people to plant something like that we do not encourage people to plant something like this just because we got a special seeds uh, from USFS um, cut leaf cornflower you could could probably bring from somewhere probably not from Rocky Mountain National Park to your house a plant one uh, so at home you basically just probably it's better if you just um, uh, buy ozone uh, monitor but it just, we just thought it's a cool opportunity because we put educational signs. Uh, people can really look at the damage, and uh, kids love it. So um, usually they plant these sort of things at schools, and it's kind of cool educational opportunity for kids to do. So like I, I live over on the western slope, so if I wanted to get schools over there involved with this and also what you're doing, Nikki, with the microplastics, mm -hmm. is that something that... Mm -hmm. I could bring over there to the Absolutely, to yeah, yeah. I can put you in touch with Danica and uh, yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Cool. I had a question Thank you. for uh, Nikki. So you put this in your wash? Yeah. And, and it, well, then, you oh, clean it. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, um, so it's pretty plastic. easy. Yeah, so if you look at it close, it's got all these little barbs in here. And right. so basically, what you do is you just kind of go into here and you can start pulling out the microplastics or microfibers that would otherwise go into uh, the, the, the wash. You pull it out. You pull it out. You don't wash it. What's that? Then do what with it? Put it, well, you put it in the trash. I mean, that's what you want to do. It yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't go into the water. I mean, that's the hope. Considerate. Yeah. You literally pull it out? You pull it out. So I've had the, mine for about, I don't know, a couple of weeks now just to see, and I pulled out a little bit, not a ton. 
Um, I also have, I don't know if you all want to look at this, but this is basically from the Pacific Garbage Patch. So this is a real sample collection. Um, and you can see the microplastics inside of there. It's pretty, it's pretty surprising. Any other questions for either of our speakers? So I think that there is um, some some work that is happening to try to you know digest petroleum. So I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, I've seen a couple of startup companies that are trying to, to work on that and trying to get super funding to make that happen and more mainstream. Um, I think like anything, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to get it to market and to make it um, widespread. But I think that there's definitely hope there that that will be helpful because I mean, if you think about it, it's it's everywhere, and so we've got to find a way, you know, to try to get rid of it. I'm sure you've seen this, but the store in, in town on Walnut, New Foods, carries a lot of different products like the um, Earthries yes. and Blue Land, which I've been using on our yacht for the last three years, as well as at home. That's all non-plastic, non-toxic. Yeah. It's great to go in there and just, you know, learn. And I have so many um, giveaways for you guys. So before you leave tonight, I have bath bombs for you from Lush. You guys can use them. They're not bad for the environment if you take bubble baths or if you love baths or know somebody who loves baths. I have tons for you to have. And then I want to give you guys Earth Breeze. And then I have some other things up here that you can look at. But um, we also, I want to make an announcement that we have stickers um, for uh, the Explorers Club. Yeah. They're they're two dollars and um, they look like yeah, this. Awesome. Yep, and so you can buy those if you'd like to. Um, and you take cash or Venmo. Yep. Yep. So you can get those if you'd like. And we uh, have shot a video of this, which we'll put on our uh, Explorers Club Facebook site. I have a question. Uh, 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 in Sweden, where we spend a lot of time, they incinerate plastic on a large scale. Yeah. Is that something that we're it's it's really interesting because when you incinerate plastic, um, and that's that happens on a lot of the the islands in the Caribbean, they don't have anywhere for it to go. And the issue with that is that you're sending in a lot of toxic um, gases into the environment, and so it really can be awful to do that. But you get rid of the physical you know presence of of that, and that's why incineration was one of the ones on the graph that I showed you. It's a very common practice to get rid of trash, is to burn it. Do you have any brain studies you'd like to do with the fish or other animals or hunters about how they're being affected? I, well, one of my, um, uh, I, we just started taking students from FAU um, into our lab, so we became faculty down there, Chris and I, who's my research, um, uh, he runs our research. And what we're going to do with one of our master's students, she's going to do um, a study on microplastics in shark blood to try to understand whether or not those animals are taking up plastic. And we're currently in a pilot study. This is another interesting side note. But we're looking at pharmaceuticals in blood of sharks. Because uh, when you're down in Miami, where we are in that area, um, everything that's urinated out into toilets, which would be heart attack medicine, um, depression medication, um, estrogen, any of those things go straight out into the environment. They do not get filtered out of the water treatment plants. And so these animals are taking up these chemicals, um, things like Prozac, heart attack medicine, erectile dysfunction medicine. All of these things are in these fish. And we have to wonder, what does that do to them? And so there was a study on bonefish that showed they have 17 different pharmaceuticals in their body. So it's like opening up the medicine cabinet and just taking everything. So we don't know uh, what that means, and, it, and we don't know what that means if we eat fish. So that's another really interesting question. Oh, yeah, Bill. Um, well, I have a, a brief comment about uh, plastic substitutes. I just recently read about, uh, there's, uh, I'm sure it's happening elsewhere, but in Iceland, um, there's a company that's harvesting uh, seaweed and using the cellulose. And it reminded me that the original cellulose clothing was actually, the, the one that I know of was created in the Pacific Islands, and it's called Tapakla. Yeah, that's great. Mm. Well, I think it's going to take a, a whole lot of ingenuity and a whole lot of flexibility for people to, to you know, accept and use new, new products. But I think that's where we are. That's where we need to head. That's for sure. Good. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank Don't you. Forget, thank November 8th.
Thank you to our speakers. And thank you to our speakers. And enjoy your night. Take care. Thanks, everybody.